Hello and welcome to the Mystic Cast, where you join Jack Stafford and Deborah Littleboy, members of the Aetherius Society, the cosmic religion for the Aquarian Age, as we break down the barriers between religion, science, metaphysics, philosophy, and mysticism, all of which are really only aspects of the self-same quest for truth. Please note this is an independent program, not produced or fact-checked by the Aetherius Society. Today, our guest is Manjiri Latte. Hello, Manjiri. Hello, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you again. Actually, you've been on my other podcast, Pod Songs, in conversation yeah. with Uday ben Benegal, a very famous Indian rock musician, and we, we're releasing us the song next week. So I don't have to do any work with this podcast. It's very good. I can just chat to you and talk to you about, because you've been involved in so many different things, um, spiritual development, psychic development, and you've really... So I thought it would be wonderful to to get you on this podcast and talk with Deborah and I about the Aetherius Society, which is something you you weren't aware of before. Is that right? No, I wasn't, and um, I appreciated the the information that was shared with me, and it was uh, lovely to get a window or a peek into what had been having or what had been documented thus far uh, with Dr. King and. Um, that it still continues with or without his physical body, that the work has continued is, uh, is, I'm really happy to know that. Yeah, because Dr. King, he was a master of yoga. But so he, what was the name of his teacher, Deborah? Do you remember who his original, in the 1950s, he he received yoga uh, instruction. And he did 10 hours, uh, eight hours a day yoga, you know, not, not yoga, asanas, but pranayama, mantra, um, and advanced practices and for 10 years um and then he raised kundalini all the way up he he went through the uh, it didn't go through the initiation of ascension but he could have done but he um yeah what well, do you remember that teacher deborah or not the only thing i i know is that he was he was told that he would be contacted by somebody who ha who ran a yoga school in london um, and then he, then that that was made the contract, and he went along there. But no, I can't actually recall the name. I don't know if I ever knew what the name of the the person was. Mm. But, uh, yeah. So it was funny that you know that because yoga came to the West, and Dr. King is the master of for the Aquarian age. So it's kind of the hemispheres of the brain of. You know, they both have to be connected. No, I mean you you you've studied in England also, uh, so you are also bridging this this divide. Right. Absolutely. And I, um, if I may also add that sometimes the name of the teacher becomes very irrelevant because that teacher was also a medium in that case. And just mm -hmm. like Buddha never said, I'm a Buddhist. I don't think any practitioner of yoga actually says I am a yogi myself. And um, I think with Dr. King as well, probably he may never have even documented the name because probably the source must have been um, somebody who didn't necessarily have a physical body that he interacted with so you never really know and the entire concept of how yoga even traveled across the globe or even how it is in India the origin or the root verb uh, in Sanskrit is the word yoga which actually means a union or a unison and unfortunate reality is that today yoga has become more about the posture and the asana and whether the union between the nose and the toe can happen rather than between <laughs> mind, body and soul or, you know, or even a union between your physical body and your consciousness with, um, you know, universal consciousness. That was what was the original aim that Patanjali had as well. And it was amazing to read that Dr. King, um, you know, in Sanskrit, we have a word tapasya, which means you you sit and do a lot of contemplative meditation and it's a huge process that you invest in with mind and body. And to be able to commit eight or nine hours a day for those many years that he did, um, I would say was the epitome of uh, commitment to a process and what it meant for him probably. Yeah. Well, we've learned that all the avatars like Jesus and the Buddha, they have to do this. I think it's about a 10 year period of purification because when they come they take on karma of they don't they come with no karma but they take they take on the karma of humanity uh, they they're in burdened with the karma of humanity so they have to do these purification practices as a sort of karmic exercise right. and uh, yeah i guess they slept less as well they just needed less sleep and they weren't they just have this single minded focus which is beyond beyond my understanding of beyond my ability i mean to be I've, the most I've ever sat down in 
Padmasana is for an hour. And then by the end of it, you're like, you're screaming, <laughs> sweats running down your back. And, and but to do it for, you know, three hours, at a, you know, to do mantra three hours straight, it's just something I can't even. Yeah. But so you studied in England as well. You were just over here. Recently. I studied in Wales about nearly what, 20 years back and I was doing a master's in outdoor education then um, because uh, back home we didn't have or we still don't have a structured approach um, or a educative approach to interaction with the outdoors and uh, how that gap can be bridged and I was glad that Britain gave that option and that I was able to leverage on it then. Yeah. Mm. And so tell us about this Earthwise project you're involved in. <laughs> Um, so Jack, from childhood, I think I've been absolutely blessed. And when we say as a soul, we choose the womb to be born into for um, the merits and the sufferings that are going to be associated with it. I I might have done some good karma in my earlier lives to be able to be born in the family that I did because both my parents were mountaineers and my mother, for example, uh, did her mountaineering courses with Sherpa Ten Singh Norge. And um, so from childhood, I remember, even if we had a sniffle or a slight cold, it was never take a tablet. It it always was the little hillock in the city. You go up and down two or three times and the system is cleansed and you bump up your water level. So as um, a youngster growing up, I don't remember even having medication at home too often because there was so much importance on interaction with the outdoors. And as I grew up, I started acknowledging that there was something um, that was much deeper as a connect between me as an individual and the and Mother Earth or nature as a whole. And it changed um, my inner nature as well every time I was interacting with outside nature. So that was something that I kept acknowledging. Um, the kind of sport pursuits that I was doing were always outdoors as well. And um, I think there was a moment of epiphany I had where I realized every action and act that we are doing, our mere breathing itself, we are answerable to the earth that's holding space for us. And if we are wise with our thought processes and our acts, um, we, uh, the earth holds us accountable for whatever we are doing. So if we can, in terms of wisdom, be wise with that, um, was where the birth of the, or I think it it was probably, I don't even remember how it, it dawned upon me that I'd love to call um, a venture I want to start Earthwise, but I also um, realized that there had to be a tagline with it, something that Earthwise stood for, and the tagline of our company is leave no trace, because whether you are, doing an intervention with an individual or a, or a group or you're a mere medium and it you are never the source so whether you're there or not you were only the conduit to bring the information and it's never hinging on you so the tagline for earthwise remained from the beginning earthwise um, leave no trace so that's where the birth of that um, company name really came up so when you when you have people come to you for earthwise how do you um, get them to connect themselves to the mother? Because we've got, I, I know that it's certainly in the West, and, and, I, and I speak for myself, it's a bit superficial. And I know what people say, and I go and sort to do it, but it's very rare that I make that, that connection and plug in. So can you maybe explain to our audience, you the method. Absolutely. Um, from the way I have approached it over the years, um, I have looked at two aspects. One is linguistics. So I use a science called NLP. It stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's a behavioral science. Um, and the other is interaction with the outdoors. So language and interaction with the outdoors is which has been the primary approach. And if I were to throw light on this, you know, in the Vedic period when uh, Vedas or the Holy Scriptures, uh, the idea was that they were never written and they worked on what in Sanskrit we call Shruti and Smruti. So um, Shruti is the ability to listen, okay, and listening is far beyond just, you know, words falling on our ears, you have come from an understanding. And Smruti works with our ability to uh, recollect, remember, and then recreate. Um, in those Vedic scriptures, the grammar that was used was more 
descriptive grammar. And as modern man, we tend to use what is, I would say, more prescriptive grammar, that this must happen, this must be done. Um, also, if you see a lot of ancient languages um, speak of collective noun, even in the villages today in a country like India, and I'm sure so many cultures, even where I've traveled in Central and South America or um, you know parts of Africa, where they speak about elements of nature having their own consciousness and people will say, hey, come to my village, uh, our house. Uh, so it's all collective noun. And the minute you move into so-called modern living, everything starts with I, me. It's very self-centric, uh, which means that there is this huge void and disconnect. So the reason I personally felt it important to focus on linguistics so that when we can change the fabric of nature within ourselves and have it more inclusive and every part of our personality needs to be accepted and integrated there are parts of our shadow that need to be integrated so linguistics had helped, helped with that and then people's interaction with nature or the great outdoors became that much easier so to find oneself as you're doing internal housekeeping and you, you just took this so-called aimless walk in a forest uh, without any media in your hand and nothing to capture, but you're living the moment. Um, there was so much. I, it's, it's almost as if nature is alive and even the rustle of the grass can be heard with huge magnitude. And um, over the years, uh, Deborah, what kept happening was I realized workshops or... Um, things that need to be brought to the audience was, was organically being curated. So, you know, something would be asked as a question by a participant in a workshop. And that led me to say, hey, you know what? Um, this seems to be a repetitive question. Let's walk down that path. And something started being curated around it. And I was getting guidance from far beyond books and humans. And uh, that's how things still continue to evolve in the work we're doing. So could you perhaps give me an example of, of, of what one of your um, participants have said back to you, like one of their aha moments? <laughs> uh, tricky question, uh, purely because I would like to believe uh, that I as a facilitator as well have those aha moments every time that we are imparting or conducting a workshop just like the others. Um, but to simplify something, there was um, an individual in one of our workshops where um, she kept saying that this is the first time I'm staying by myself in a room because, uh, you know, she the kind of upbringing she had had, there was a large joint family, she was never by herself. And um, so I asked her, so what about you staying alone in your room during that residential process? She said, every time I'm alone, this big black cloud hovers around me. And um, I'm extremely nervous and it, it um, you know, unnerves me purely because I keep feeling extremely scared about its presence. So because we, as Earthwise, we constantly say communicate with everything around you, it has its consciousness, whether it's a dream, it's an idea, it's a book. Everything and everything in under the sun can be spoken to and its vibrational awareness will answer. So um, the two of us sat down and I said, how about you having a conversation with that big cloud? She said, but with you, when you are with me, it's not going to be around. It's only when I'm by myself that the cloud emerges. I said, wonderful. So the moment I step out of this room and you're going to be by yourself uh, at night. And apparently that cloud was visible to her only at night when she would sleep. So we chalked out a little plan for her saying, wonderful, you go into your room to rest for the day. And as you turn your lights, lights off and you keep that little dim little candle burning, the, the cloud emerges, uh, what are the questions you would like to ask? And they were non-leading open-ended questions that we ideated on, which meant that, are you this? Are you here to scare me? Are leading questions. More open-ended would be, you know, who are you? What have you come here for? And within half an hour, she came banging on my door and she said, Manjiri, that actually is my... Um, guiding spirit and it it's that's precisely why only when I'm by myself does that cloud come up because it's basically telling me I'm here to take care of you and you're not alone and um, so it was imperative for her to be by herself in seclusion in the dark in her room for that presence to make itself visible and apparent to her 
And, you know, for that entire evening, I'm thinking so many of us probably had these experiences, whether we call them nightmares as dreams that visit us as well. But there is something wanting to communicate with us and reach us and bring us some wisdom and guidance. And we operate from a very default setting that if it doesn't align with the typical um, methods of what is pleasant and unpleasant, the minute it is commonly known unpleasant, we tend to discard it saying, you know, response from fear. Um, but something like this keeps happening in different workshops. People speak to body parts, speak, people speak to fibroids in their body, um, and they have vivid conversations on what the organ in the body wishes for them to know. So um, it's an ongoing process. That's wonderful. In fact, what, when, I was, when I was listening to you there, I, I record um, something that Dr. King said in one of his lectures. He's a very straight, very straightforward man. He said, if you need to test to see whether the, um, the trees um, are real, are like, are, can, you can talk to trees and whether, the, um, whether there are fairies and whether there are gnomes in the woods, then go on your own. Or if you're going to go with somebody else, make sure that they're very respectful and don't talk. Go on your own. and." send out love in healings in other words because we were, we were we're taught how to bring the universal life force through our bodies and send it out in love and in appreciation and in gratitude so his audience would have been aware of that and he said and you will you're not you not you might you will in fact unless you are completely insensitive you will feel the response so um, yeah, I've had some wonderful experiences with, by doing exactly that or finding a tree that's sort of going, come and sit next to me type of bone. <laughs> come and put your back next to me, Deborah. Oh, yeah, I love, I just love that. Thanks, tree. Um, um, and so, so we have a whole load of people thinking that I'm like, well, I am a little bit off centre. But, but the fact is it is real. Uh, and just to hear that, um, and fabulous for that lady that's been so scared of the thing that was there to help her that whole time. She must have felt wonderful. She must have felt like a whole, a whole burden had been just taken off of her back. Absolutely. That's Undoubtedly, I think. And she would have, um, usually people who tend to live with these fears that are known or unknown, that can even be unconscious, um, you know, even work of Louise L. Hay has documented this, and I'm sure many practitioners know this, that the minute you're carrying an emotional burden, your spine tends to be under constant pressure as well. It's almost as if you're carrying a bag filled with rocks and then issues with spine, shoulders, lower back, knees. And that lady, she had barely been doing physical activity for the last 15 or 16 years. Today, she regularly does long walks. She is a healthy grandmother. Um, so it's it's... It's amazing to um, watch the transformation an individual goes through. The minute they're ready to, um, I wouldn't even use the word face their fears, but just to converse with their fears. Because the minute we say we have to face something, it may come from fight and flight and that, uh, you know, there's an aggression probably as an underlying layer. But you say, hey, let's sit down for a chat and a conversation. And simple questions can um, open up so many doorways of awareness. So do you think that it's, it's to do with the, the vibration that we, we are tuned to or have been detuned from? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when we're in nature, we go back to what we are because we are part of, part of our mother. And so you think that that is probably the, the, the alignment that comes in, into play there? Thank you for asking that question because... Um... I personally believe, and I know that there are many books which have been written, which actually say that in the evolution, that man is at the top of the pyramid and we have been through other life forms to become a man. But exactly like you mentioned right now, Deborah, just a walk in the forest and when a tree calls out to you, because you need the healing, not what the tree needs, um, the wisdom they have in the mycelium network underground and the wisdom that's around us and I would say it is non-judgmental and egoless 
those life forms, I would think, are actually more evolved than we as humans who lead such a disconnected life. So even when we think that we are calling the shots and we are controlling things, Mother Nature knows how to uh, put us in line when it is time. So I would think everything around us has a higher vibrational awareness and a higher level of consciousness as well. And an example for this would be, uh, y'all are probably aware of pendulum dowsing and we can actually douse for different levels of consciousness. And, and for that, if we use the work of Dr. David Hawkins, uh, who used the seven chakras in the body, the primary chakras with color bands and how emotions are stored as well with those corresponding um, vibrational values. If we were to douse a human body, somebody who does a lot of meditation, we would still vibrate lower in consciousness than a tree and a mountain, which probably have so much more to give us than uh, an ego-driven human. Um, and I also think, um, and actually it is in one of David Hawkins' books where he's saying that only a person with integrity um, is allowed access to the truth. So when even when we say that I am channeling universal energy through me to um, you know, pass it on to somebody for healing, my personal healing or anything, probably our level of integrity, honesty and level of consciousness would dictate the flow that comes through us. Probably a trickle versus a flood would be dictated by our own everyday beliefs and practices and how aligned we are. Um, to the greatest good and to Mother Earth. And that's probably, that will dictate how much gets channeled through us. Um, yeah, that that I genuinely believe then that nature is then guiding us to melt into her, become one with, uh, with her. Um, in fact, there was this Bolivian shaman from the Ayamara tribe that I was um, uh, living with at their center about three years back. And I remember him mentioning that nature, when he was growing up in the forest and in the mountains, he said we would barely have any clothes on us because that was the best way of connecting with the, um, what he would call it, the heartbeat of Pachamama. And he would say the minute we would lie down fully stark naked onto the ground, we would blend in and melt in and we could feel one with the earth. Um, and I think as modern man, when we have... Um, you know, in our evolution, we were earlier probably reptiles. And if we just go with the Darwinian process and then from four-legged, we became this Homo erectus. And in, in doing this, I think we've gone further away from reality than ever before. So I think nature calls us in its own way that come sit, uh, touch more of your body with the tree, with the earth. And it, it's, it's only if we're willing to listen to what uh, she's guiding us with. And, and that... That aligns perfectly with what we're told from the Cosmic Masters and Dr. King that to receive truth, we have to speak truth. And so, and so that integrity just goes right the way through the gambit there. And we're also told that um, people that channel in um, entities from other, other realms, other planets, other galaxies, whatever, the, the medium has to be of a certain elevation to enable the, the higher entity to, to come down. So, they, so the higher entity comes down as far as they can, but, we, but, but can come no further. And if, if they were to impose their thoughts on a, on a brain, on a consciousness that was not evolved, that was too far out of tune, would fry it. Basically, yes. end up pride. So, so I mean that that again um, falls so much into the. We have to be so discriminative when we're when we're taking information from people set that are saying that they're channeling information, and we look to see what that person is like, and we look to see what they what they physically are like, and what their word their words, what words they say. Um, Jesus said, judge a man by his actions, not by, you know, and, and it's so, it's so in line with the being in, in integrity with our mother, because we are of her. And, and yeah, so yes, yeah, thank you so much. It's lovely to hear, to hear the same truth come from a, 
from a different perspective. Um, and you said it beautifully. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I said I was going to stay muted on this call, <laughs> and, I, and I'm so sorry, love. But... No, well, it's good. I've got the plumbers in, actually, so it's good you've uh, had to... Bit of bit of materialist work necessary, but no, it's. I mean, we could keep talking you to you for so long, man, Jerry. You've got so you've studied so many different, and we'll have to get you on the show again. It's really um, thank you. But what maybe just to finish up, what 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 do you think? Uh, what would you like to leave the audience with? Wow, I have to be able to articulate and fit in uh, a lot. I would I would say a couple of top of my head things that nature um, has brought to my awareness is what I would love to uh, put out. Um, one is to stop humanizing everything around us and anthropomorphizing everything um, and appreciate things for the value and the uniqueness that they present us with, um, which also means no tree is judging another tree for a crooked branch and the tree says you are complete and whole the way you are. Um, so without humanizing things, if you can appreciate the uniqueness in us as humans and every element around us. Um, I would also think that acknowledging and judging that we are all seamlessly connected with each other and we don't need to go to a workshop to learn to be able to do it. You just need to pop a question and the answers will come from anything and everything. It can be a lost object at home, a bunch of keys we can't find, a pair of spectacles and we ask them where have I left you without judging ourselves or the fear of failure and the object will communicate with us. Um, yeah. And I think keeping um, our linguistics and grammar as inclusive and as collective noun as we probably can, even when um, people say, I am the healer or I am the teacher, um, I think we're missing the point if we are only facilitating something to flow through us um, and we are even facilitating childbirth and we may be parenting somebody. It's a responsibility that has been given to us for that soul. We are not the source of it. So if we can start acknowledging that um, we have divinity within us and um, yeah, and make our life a gift in some form or the other, it can be um, just being honest and true and aligned is probably what I would couple of things that come to mind right now. That's beautiful. Yeah. Cause that neuro neuro linguistic programming is such a, is it difficult to get your head around what that is, but I think you've really explained it very clearly. And uh, you run these workshops in India. Are you going to plan to run one in Europe or America? <laughs> um, probably one day. Yes. At the moment, thanks to the pandemic, people are um, internet savvy. So people have been logging in from different parts of the world and I have stopped asking questions as to how they came to know about the workshops because I have somebody <laughs> logging in from some remote corners of God knows where. I've never heard of a city. And um, so th that's phenomenal. But physically uh, conducting maybe one day, um, Tathasto and amen to that idea. But uh, if it's meant to evolve that way, I'm sure it would. So how can people join the online sessions? Um, so our website, earthwise.co.in has an inquiry form that people can write to. And then um, I'm now learning to use the World Wide Web um, and the internet. So the Instagram pages are what I'm slowly learning. It's out to an individual. They are more than happy to jump in and join those. Wonderful. Okay. And if people would like to learn more about the Ethereum Society, they can go to ethereus.org. Thank you, Manjiri. Thank you for having me.